Now going to a totally different area of antimicrobial resistance to again understand the, the pathogenesis and the pathophysiology of the whole concept of emergence of antimicrobial resistance, I'm going to talk about that through discussing the chain of transmission and infection. The first slide, or the first part of this slide, shows AMR, which is antimicrobial resistance, being produced and emerging within the uh, hospital environment. Um, the antibiotic selection pressure, as I mentioned before, where there's excessive use of broad-spectrum antibiotics, transmission of these emerging pathogens on the hands of the healthcare workers through devices as well, and causing these patients to become colonized with very highly pathogenic uh, and highly multi-drug resistant pathogens. Some of these patients, unfortunately, do pass away. However, some of them do recover and go back into the community. Once they're in the community, they're colonized with these bacteria and they could eventually spread it to their household contacts. And that way they will be exposing the children uh, within the community. And again, more use of antibiotics within the community for these patients coming into the hospital already primed with significantly resistant bacteria. Now there's another part of the circle of emergence of antimicrobial resistance, which can take a whole different lecture beyond what we will be talking about today, which is the emergence of antimicrobial resistance from the animal side. And the zoonotics uh, usage, or the usage by veterinarians for antimicrobial resistance, is mentioned to be more than 150% worse than that in the human use. And hence, you can see that animal exposure to humans can, uh, within the community may also fuel into the AMR problem within the humans, leading to bigger problems. So where do we go from here? We need, in our next few slides, to describe how can we break these different chains of infection. And I think talking to you today as a prescriber, um, I'd like to focus on what can we do to decrease the emergence of resistance within the community and within the hospital setting, specifically as a prescriber. The things that we need to do, and I think even though we're not going to be going into too much detail, but as uh, future physicians, regardless of what specialty you're going to be doing, you need to be educated about this antimicrobial resistance issue. You need to be familiar that regardless of what specialty you're going to be doing, you might be contributing to this global issue of antimicrobial resistance. Um, we need to educate the prescriber on disease prevention, other mechanisms for preventing disease. Encourage to engage their patients on reasons and consequences of antimicrobial resistance. If you're working in the community and you're a primary physician, your patients might be coming with common colds requesting for antibiotics in situations where we know that fluids and bed rest would be enough. And when we know that viral infections, which are not treated by antibiotics, may be the cause of their symptoms. We need to educate the prescriber on the existence of local guidelines and treatment algorithms in order to encourage them and to empower them with the knowledge to de-escalate their therapy. And even if you have to start with broad spectrum antibiotics, there's always a time where you're capable of de-escalating and using narrow spectrum antibiotics. There needs to be a system where we as physicians who prescribe antibiotics, we need to be audited, we need to be educated, and we need to be uh, looked into how we're dispensing antibiotics from the pharmacies to the healthcare settings to the primary healthcare. And we need to be made aware of the existence and roles of the hospital stewardship programs, which is a very young and emerging concept within the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and many of the hospitals in the next years will be adopting uh, stewardship programs, and hopefully you can all be part of those initiatives. The second part to break this chain of infection and transmission is to look at the healthcare worker. Now, the healthcare worker, even though I, I mentioned the prescriber is a healthcare worker, but a healthcare worker goes beyond the prescriber. We're talking about nurses, RTs, um, unit assistants, anybody who is within and functioning within the healthcare setting. 
Now, these people need to comply with basic infection control practices. And I hope you'll have the time to look at this uh, at another presentation that I'll be giving on this specific issue, wearing the personal protective equipment, which we refer to as PPEs, and disposal, the proper disposing of these PPEs, specifically also complying with hand hygiene moments and being a role model in complying with infection control practices. Now moving to the infection control practices, which, the, which is the overarching uh, link between the transmission of these pathogens from the patients who are carrying them, from the equipment that they um, are carried on, to the inanimate surfaces that they may exist on. So infection control plays a major role in breaking this chain of infection and transmission of antimicrobial resistance between different patients, between the patient and the healthcare worker, between the healthcare worker and his or her household contacts within the community. So the infection control practices need to be adopted and there has to be a systematic surveillance method where we can keep our fingers on the pulse the same way that I showed you the studies where hospitals should have their antibiograms. And I encourage each one of you, whenever they think of prescribing an antibiotic in a specific hospital, to ask the microbiology lab for the antibiogram. And over the years, you can find a trend of emergence of resistance or dropping susceptibility to certain antibiotics for certain pathogens. There also has to be surveillance for healthcare-associated infections linking them to specific pathogens, as well as community-acquired infections, or CAIs. There needs to be a specific infection prevention control program within the hospital that has a separate department re uh, reporting to a higher authority and able to establish an infection control program, a surveillance program to allow for interventions and communication with the healthcare workers, and they need to be accountable for producing such data and assisting in developing intervention programs. There also needs to be a, designa a designation, a reference microbiology laboratory, and able to uh, monitor the emergence of resistance within the community, and that probably would be referring to the Ministry of Health within a specific country to understand the emergence of resistance within that specific country. Now, the chain of infection can also be broken at the last level here that I, I will conclude with, with, the, with the breaking the chain of infection with the patient, him or herself. The patient requires education. And even though some of you may not be aware that you do have a role in speaking to your patients, educating them about antimicrobial resistance, um, encouraging them to accept the appropriate antibiotics to be used, there needs to be measures in preventing infections other than the use of antibiotics, such as immunizations, hand hygiene at the home, cough etiquette, not sneezing in your hand and touching uh, surfaces, uh, making sure that when you are ill that you do not mix with other patients as well, general infection control practices that need to be taken place. There also be, uh, needs to be um, household and community hygiene, specifically when dealing with animals. We do know that certain pathogens, such as salmonella, for example, can be transmitted from uh, chicken and poultry and eggs. And with poor hand hygiene, with poor um, hygiene techniques within the kitchen itself can lead to transmission of pathogens. And that can happen in the hospital, kitchen, or food preparation areas, or it can ha happen in the community. Certain pets as well that people need to be aware of can carry resistant pathogens that can be transmitted to humans. Um, there needs to be an education for the common cold. One of the most commonest misuses of antimicrobial agents within the community is for the common cold. Alternatives to antimicrobial agents such as um, fluids and bed rest are much more beneficial than the use of antimicrobial agents. And again, the appropriate and informed healthcare-seeking behavior, where some of the patients are insistent on um, requiring an antimicrobial agent, it is our role to spend some of the time with them, to convince them, and to encourage them that the use of antimicrobial agents without a specific indication is actually detrimental to their health and is adding to the global problem of emergence of antimicrobial resistance. 
Now, this is a, a slide that was produced by Leper in 2002, and it, again, I wanted to show you the consumption of a specific antibiotic and its relationship to the resistance. You can see that amipenem resistance and amipenem consumption um, go hand in hand. Whenever there was an increase and a surge in the use of amipenem, there was a surge in the resistance specifically for Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which was included in this specific article.